Okay, so can I ask um, the audience to let me know sort of who you are? Do you do uh, does anyone in the audience kind of do active research with number with data of some sort? Put your hands up high in the sky if you do that. Um, it's interestingly few. Uh, so who else is here? Are there librarians, people who work in, in publishing? Is that, yeah, cool. Um, okay, so I have put together some slides to basically motivate why you should do some reproducible research and some of the tools that will allow you to do reproducible research. Um, I may skip over some of the tools because I feel like they're much more useful um, for people who are going to actually use them. However, uh, in the bottom right corner of all of my slides is the DOI to Figshare to, to download these slides. And what I would really love to encourage you to do is basically, if, even if you're not going to use these skills, you know, and it's always the case when you run an event, an evening event about open science, you usually find that there are people who are already pretty big on open science that attend. Um, please do share these. At the very, very end of my talk, you'll sort of see kind of how I can hopefully keep the, the support going after this evening. But I just want to really emphasize that that my message is everybody can do, can take a little step, some can do like big steps, towards making their research more reproducible. And I would love for that message to kind of continue to percolate out. So this is me, that's a silly picture. Um, I'm a research fellow at the Alan Turing Institute for Data Science, which is in London, but I'm also a research associate in the Department of Psychiatry at University of Cambridge, and I work as part of a large consortium um, studying adolescent brain development. Um, and I just finished in June of this year was my last month as a, a Mozilla Fellow for Science. And I want to describe, like, define some words for you. So. If you have a given research question, some hypothesis, um, I'm a neuroscientist, so let's say we're going to talk about your brain getting bigger as you get older, <laughs> which is actually it's the, actually the other way around, but let's just go with brain getting bigger because it feels a bit better. Um, so if you receive the exact same data that I have when I do my study, and the exact same code or analysis pipeline, the steps that I took to process that data, and you get the same numbers that I have written up in my publication, I call that reproducible research. And when I'm in, when I am not being recorded, I call that the bare effing minimum for research in the 21st century. Um, I'm more interested in what happens if you take my pipeline and you run it on your data. Are you able, for the given research question, do brains get bigger as you get older, are you able to find the same result? And if you are, with my code, with my pipeline, then I would say that you can replicate my findings. However, you may have a better way uh, or a different way of uh, asking that question. You may have these sort of different steps that you're like, yes, yes, Kirsty, we're still trying to answer the question, do brains get bigger as you get older? Um, but I think my way is better than your way. And if we both run on the exact same data set, our two different pipelines, I would say that we now have a, a finding that is robust to those decisions that we have sort of individually made, whether we've decided to code it up, um, by hand, or whether we've decided to run it through a cloud computing system, or you know whatever our various different sort of methods are. And then I think it's a really exciting opportunity to start to move towards generalizable research. So if I think about my research, the two sort of applications of work that I do to try and better understand why teenagers are so particularly at risk of developing schizophrenia, psychosis, depression, anxiety, um, is either 
to support clinicians who may be working with young people who are having um, mental health challenges. And I want the clinicians to be able to understand what's happening and, and support those young people. But I also want uh, government level policymakers to be able to kind of put in place more funding to a national health service or better support in schools or really understanding kind of what is needed to improve the lives of, of um, these young people. And until we are able to get the same results on different data sets and robust to different types of quest different types of analysis pipelines, we are nowhere near that goal of being able to actually make a real world difference. So that's, it's not generalized research, super important, nowhere near there, but it is generalizable. We are getting that extra step towards saying, well, you know, if you do it in two different data sets, if two different researchers do it, and we get the same results, what about if three did it? What about if four? We can start to really understand that finding. So what are the barriers to reproducible research? Um, there's lots, and I've put some up on the slide, and I'm going to kind of go through them. These two um, that I've highlighted of doing reproducible research is not considered for promotion, and that uh, if you do reproducible research, you may actually experience you may be held to higher standards than people who provide absolutely nothing when they submit their manuscript for peer review. These are two problems that I think are deeply systemic and they need to change and they need to change at the institutional level. So administrators at the university need to understand that hiring decisions have to include how reliable, how reproducible is this person's work? And we also, I do this personally as a peer reviewer, and I would love to see everyone else kind of join me in understanding that when a paper is submitted with zero code and zero data available to assess, it is just a story. And as scientists, we want to think that we are different to people who write fiction. I believe that we are. These like stories of, of fraud, you know, these like copy and pasting your like picture, your cells four times. I mean, they blow my mind because I don't understand how people could be so sort of, um, I, I don't know how they could make such an easy mistake. I do, just to be clear, the, the incentive structure sort of pushes people. I get that. It passed two and it passed, two, it passed two rounds of peer review. So, you know, we have like a deeply broken system. But I got in trouble a few months ago for being recorded <laughs> at an event like this. So let's hope it doesn't happen again. For saying that I don't worry about fraud. And the, the, the trouble on Twitter was, you know, what do, you, what do you mean? You don't care about fraud. Like, it's really important. How can you, how can you say that? And... It's not that I think fraud is fine, that I'm like plus wanting fraud all over the place. It's that I think the number of people who commit explicit fraud like that is very small. I think it's the tip of the iceberg. I'm very like, I think it's great to identify. It's very embarrassing for a field to, to have these sort of results that have to be retracted. But what I'm much, much more concerned about are the fact that we are allowing people to publish results have them picked up by the media, have them included in public policy when there's actually no way of reviewing their work and no way of reviewing their evidence. So that is my big rant on like institutional level, fix this. There's a massive publication bias towards novel findings and yeah, that annoys me. I think it ties in really well with Lawrence's point about you need to have this sort of perfect story and it needs to be like the best story. And one of the things that I, I love about new ways of publishing, whether it's a preprint or whether it's at Science Matters or, or sort of um, work that is a little bit more sort of incremental is that you can potentially put up your work and you can say, look, I tried to replicate this finding. I wasn't able to. I'm going to leave this here and at least it's public, it's citable, 
people can read it. Because otherwise, the way in which you find out that it's not just you making a mistake is that you go to conferences and you talk to all the other people that are doing work that's in a similar field to you, and you're like, huh, we're all struggling to find that. But you only know it through sort of like um, a chat over a beer, which I think is an inefficient way of transmitting information in the 21st century. This is um, the, the sort of argument that like really drives me crazy. Pleading the fifth, this is like an Americanism referring to um, the fact that you cannot be compelled to give evidence against yourself in court. So I hear people say that they don't want to do reproducible research because you might find out that I made a mistake in my work. And that just makes me like, I don't know, it makes me roll my eyes a lot. And I think if I'm being a little bit more generous, it's we're back aligned to this sort of, this problem with the incentive structure, that it's no longer okay to say, huh, I did some, I did some good work, but I, I'm human, I made a mistake, that this sort of, you know, once a paper is published, it is gospel, and it should be left, and no one should question it. It's rubbish. Um, this is a barrier that I, th I think is, um, is easily solvable, that if you make your code available, you'll have to answer lots and lots of pe uh, questions from people about it. And I want to just sort of tell you that from my experience of making code available, code that is... I have two, sets, uh, two, two different types of, of code. I have code that I've made available and I want contributors to, I want to build it up into software that's sort of more usable across lots of different areas. That's great. I'm very happy to support additional users on that front. But I also have code that is available for reproducible reasons only. You can use it. You can check my work. If you want to do something with it, go for it. It's openly licensed but I am not currently supporting additional developments on that code. And you can say that in your license file. You can make that very clear. So this sort of concern that you might get lots of emails, I do, A, I don't think it's that bad, and B, later on I'm gonna tell you to document your work and then you won't have a problem. <laughs> um, it does take time, but I don't think it takes as much time in the end. I think that if you work reproducibly, the main person who benefits is you. Um, it does require additional skills though. And that's the actual, that's the main amount of time is the, is the learning the new skill and figuring it all out. And so that's what sort of a lot of these resources that I'm gonna kind, kind of probably just fly through um, are here to support early career researchers senior researchers who want to support their early career researchers, anyone who wants to do it, we can, we can make these easier to acquire. So one of my favorite um, uh, pieces of recommendation is basically start small. And I am not paid by protocols.io. I am in no way affiliated with protocols.io, but I am a huge fan of protocols.io. <laughs> And basically what um, it allows you to do is build up a checklist. It pretty much, um, I'm just gonna flip onto this one. It allows you to write in different steps that need to be done. Um, this one is particularly, this one is set up to help uh, researchers in, at, at Cambridge get set up to run particular analyses on our computing cluster. Because what you can do, the, the video isn't working, but let me just see, what does this do? Woo. Um, no, I'm not gonna try that. The, you can see in the top right corner, there's a zero out of 13 steps complete. So what you can do is as you're walking through this checklist that I've created, you can just check them all off and you can work through and you can see where you're getting stuck. It's also built on top of GitHub and so you're actually able to fork it. So you're able to make a copy to yourself. You can change it. You know, Maybe there's a whole bunch of stuff that says insert Kirsty's username here. Well, you could change that to yours. Then it keeps those different versions. And again, it allows you to sort of provide this link to say, even if I haven't written perfect software that does absolutely everything from beginning to end, this is much, much more reproducible than 
A, I, either nothing at all or B, the sort of the two or three paragraphs that we fit into a method section at the moment. But if you're going to code your analyses, it's a good skill. It's, um, it can be a little frustrating to learn if you don't really enjoy banging your head against a brick wall. No, it, it can be a little difficult to learn, but it is really valuable. Um, my sort of take home is that comments are your friend. These, everything that's italics there, it starts with a hash is a, is a comment. Um, I get a lot of pushback on this point of aim for 40% of comments in your code. If you are starting out, just even if you think you will never forget what that line means because it's so obvious to you at the moment, I am here from the future to tell you that writing down two or three sentences that say, this is what I'm trying to achieve with this line, and this is the link to a blog post that helped me figure it out, put it in and future you will be delighted. Um, one of the easiest ways to get going with collaborative research is, to, is if someone sends you some code that they've written and they send it to you and they're like, oh, it's rubbish, it's rubbish, you know, I'm sure it's no good, I keep meaning to document it, or whatever they say, um, and you work through it, and usually it, it is pretty helpful, add in some comments and send that back so that the next new grad student that comes into your lab doesn't have to do the same work. Like, how nice is that? This is collaborative science. We will all move forward together. But importantly, back to selfish science, it's almost always going to be you. The next person to use that piece of code is you to add in those comments. Um, this is a, just a great tweet of me from two months ago, never responds to email. I think this is a really important point. Um, the lot of people, particularly people like me, um, are in of, I don't, I don't publish any work on my own. I've, I've no single author papers. That is not the way that sort of large scale neuroscience projects, even small scale neuroscience projects work. So I have never been allowed to make my code available before it was published. That's just something that kind of, I've, I've not yet convinced my co-authors to permit. If you are a member of an educational institution, you can have a discount, which means zero, um, from GitHub, and you can have unlimited private repositories. So you can now have private repositories. You can version control everything. You can work collaboratively with the people that you want to see your code. And you can, one day, when your paper is accepted at Science and you're like, yes, you can just click Make Public. And boom, you've got it. You've worked in a reproducible way, but you have kept everybody happy along the path. So reproducible is the really important part. At some point, that requires the data and the code to be open, but only at the point where you're going to actually start sort of claiming something. Um, working openly is great. I can sort of evangelize about that in a totally different talk. But for right now, you can work privately if you want to. But when you publish your paper, you need to also make your code and data available. Um, what am I, how am I doing for time? Am I like way over? A couple of minutes. There's lots of languages. Here are some examples of languages <laughs> that you can code in. Um, yeah. Here you go. I like this. I like Jupyter Notebook. I give a little just because we're um, in Switzerland. Um, I loved that when the gravitational waves were sort of identified, that all of that data was made available and all of these notebooks that allow you to sort of have text that explains what's going on, as well as a bunch, as, as a sort of a section of code that then spits out a figure for you. You can interact with it, you can change it, you can break it, you can change the colors, you can sort of, it's a really fantastic learning tool. And also if you want to learn signal processing, you know, you can figure that out as well. Um, I wanted to put in just a very little point about minimum working examples. I think a lot of people are very nervous to ask questions about coding because there is a sort of culture in a lot of online forums of, duh, how could you ask such a stupid question? Um, and that sucks, and those people should just be 
conflict. Um, but you can help people help you by really clarifying exactly what you're trying to do and exactly where you're having the problem. And I learned this new term recently called um, rubber ducking, rubber duck debugging. And the idea is that you imagine that you are talking to somebody else, someone, at your rubber duck that you can carry around with you. But it could also be your colleague. It could also be um, a person, you know, a, a person that you think might be able to help you. And what you will usually find is that as you make very clear exactly what you've done, exactly what you're trying to do, exactly where you're um, sort of what the errors are uh, telling you, A, you will often actually figure out the problem yourself. But B, by making a sort of an, a, a clear two or three paragraphs that explains your goals and your challenges, when you post that online, you will solicit much more valuable feedback. Um, and, and that's just a nice, it's just a nice feeling all around. Version control is really good. I don't have time to go through it, but you've all, you've all seen folders that look exactly like this. My favorite by far, I like the R dot dat that's about halfway down because I feel like I've, I've like named a lot of files. My, my files are actually la la land. There's for some reason L and A, I just go la la la. And that's my sort of temporary file when I'm trying to figure things out. But I also adore this like underscore capital letters use this one. Um, there is a very nice open source um, tool called Git, which will do that version control for you. It will allow you to go forwards and backwards in time. It will allow you to sort of branch off and play around with something and then come back. GitHub sits on top of Git and basically provides like a sort of social chat, a couple of other features, but a way to talk with people when you are all in different places. Um, there's some jargon, and this is where I start saying that this is where I will support you and anyone that you pass this along to in the future. Um, if you are nervous about whatever this whole GitHub thing is, just try it. There's already a project called yourfirstpullrequest.github.io, which is really great, and I've done it there. But if you want to do something a little bit more... Um, applicable, I have a repository on GitHub that's called Reproducible Research, and I have a, um, a jargon-busting glossary page that is there, and if you can think of a word that is not currently on there, and there's only about four words that are on there, um, you can make a copy of that repository, you can edit it, you can submit a pull request. I promise, my pledge to you is that I will be friendly and supportive and kind, and we will get your first pull request merged, and you will then be able to go out into this big scary world of programmers. There's lots of people, there's lots of resources to help you, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Questions? No question. Do you have uh, an idea of the percentage of reproducible or non-reproducible research? <laughs> it's a tricky like, question. No. What's the what's John Anidis number of most published research is false? Um, I mean, I like how much research. If you went and looked at the journal article, how much information would be there to actually reproduce their findings? I think like 0.0001%, like less than that. I mean, it's so rare to have data and code be available. Um, whether, and then I, whether the researchers themselves would be able to reproduce it so that, you know, I don't know if like someone knocked on their door and was like, gun to your head, reproduce that finding. I even think that less than 1% of people would be able to do that. So I, um, yeah, I think it's a big problem. Still some work. <laughs> so I think the schema at the beginning is very interesting, like reproducible versus all these other things. But if we're all gonna talk about reproducible research, then why do we use that term to be the, the least meaningful corner 
of the graph. It's kind of a public relations problem, right? Well, or it's the most important one. Like, it's because it's minimum, exactly. I was in a... Um, I was, I was at, a, at a pub with some friends of mine who have never worked in academia, right? They, you know, they've never had a sort of, they've never done research in the way that kind of publishing research would work. And it, I was telling them about my new fellowship and I was telling them about how I was going to go and tell people about how important it was to do reproducible research, blah, 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 and how it's really great and you had to code everything because you can make mistakes in Excel sheets. And I told, you know, the story about kind of dragging and getting the wrong number of cells and all this sort of stuff. And it took us about an hour and a half to get to the point where they were like, wait, so when you're reviewing a paper, you don't even have that Excel sheet to be able to look at what they've done? And I was like, oh my goodness, that's the crazy problem. So yes, I, I hear you that like reproducible is this minimum step and wouldn't it be nice if we had much more sort of reliable and generalizable findings um i i'm personally fine with whatever we call it <laughs> if we can start actually kind of trusting the scientific literature a little better hey that was great so look there's a lot of discussion about whether um whether reproducible research should be considered for, uh, for career development, career promotions, for example. What do you think? Would this become a norm? Instead of just looking at, looking at where you have published, which has become a norm these days, if you had a nature or a science, or even if the paper is not reproducible, as long as it's a high impact factor paper, then this, con this is considered for your uh, career. But shouldn't we have a policy that says every researcher should publish at least one or two papers that, that deals with reproducibility, that is, that the reproducible research becomes some kind of, uh, you know, um, something that is absolutely vital So to consider promotion. Yeah, so there's a really fantastic article that's quite a few um, years old now that are like selfish reasons to, re to work reproducibly. And I would say the best way to get really good, impactful research, and I don't mean like journal impact factor, I mean like actual impact, impact on the real world, impact on other researchers in your field, is to just work reproducibly from the beginning. You've got it all there, everything works, people can check it if they find a mistake, you fix it, everything's cool, man. I don't think that there needs to be any sort of quota on the number of papers that every, you know, there's no minimum number of papers that everyone should be forced to publish that's, that are reproducible. I think the burden actually goes on, uh, for me, the burden is on, on not publishing non-reproducible work. So the top guidelines are the transparency and open policy guidelines, and uh, journals can sign up to those to sort of, assess a paper, uh, a, a manuscript, on how transparent, how open, how reproducible their paper is. And that's the angle that I'm much more sort of focused on. The flip side being, I think we are sort of abandoning, particularly in the life sciences, uh, early career researchers to become, have to sort of master what I consider to be probably too, too many different aspects of the, of the work. So either better collaborations or better skills training or both. Thank you again, Kirsty. We will share a discussion uh, with the aperitif. So, of course, applause. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Super. Just uh, let me remind you that the conference goes on for the next two days. And tomorrow, um, we will talk about research data. So please join. And thank you again for these three really great and stimulating talks.